Hello and welcome to session B102, uh, Monetizing Snackable Content. My name is Bo Kelleher. I'm the Director of Solution Engineering for Kaltura. Kaltura is an online video platform and an over-the-top uh, delivery company. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working with uh, a number of the, uh, the selected panelists here today. Um, and I wanted to introduce them because each of these gentlemen uh, that are up here today uh, are tycoons and experts in the field of monetizing snackable uh, or small size uh, digital content. Um, uh, to my left here, I have, uh, I have Tyler. Uh, Tyler Peterson is the uh, Chief Operating Officer at Newsbeat Social. Newsbeat Social is an organization uh, that delivers content uh, uh, first and foremost to Facebook. Um, so they're, they're uh, delivering uh, one minute content uh, and being able to monetize that specifically on the Facebook platform. Uh, uh, to his left is Robert Bardunas. Robert uh, is, is a digital media executive <coughs> with uh, Iris TV and Iris is in the business of uh, personalizing content delivery and discovering different ways to be able to help content find you. Um, to, to Robert's left is Jim Spencer. Uh, Jim is the founder of Newsy. Uh, Newsy uh, was recently acquired and I'll let Jim tell you a little bit about that. Uh, but Newsy has been in the business for quite a while of delivering snackable content. Uh, and uh, on the end of our panel here is Ray Adipa. Ray is uh, the, the, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Shandy Media. Uh, and Shandy Media uh, uh, operates uh, sites like um, The Fumble and Hollywire, uh, Holly Scoop, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Ray will tell you a little bit more about his company. So um, with those introductions, I, just, I wanted to you know, open the panel and go down uh, the line and ask uh, each of our panelists uh, <coughs> for their definition as it applies to their business of what snackable content is. Tyler? <coughs> uh, thank you, Bo. Uh, snackable content for us, just to give you a background on Newsbeat Social, uh, we launched our news company two years ago. Uh, we're headquartered in Portland, Oregon, and we produce uh, one-minute videos. They're anchored, they're contextualized, and they're primarily distributed inside of Facebook. So we have this global audience consuming our one-minute video news headlines, and we have bureaus in uh, Portland, D.C., New York. Uh, recently opened up a bureau in the Philippines and Hyderabad, India. So. Uh, by our definition, it's we have our one product and it's one minute long and it's for Facebook. So that definition probably skews depending on the platform you primarily operate on. So uh, for Newsbeat, it's one minute and one minute long. So from the Iris perspective, we're really looking at about how users are consuming the content, and and it really comes down to consumption time or, or length of the video clip. <clears throat> so I think obviously it depends on device. But really, when you average it out, I think 90 seconds is really the ceiling of what you consider snackable, especially when you think about how you daisy chain content together and clips together and their relationship with advertising. I think to consider something snackable or even bite-sized content, you're looking at 90 seconds or under. Cool. Um, I'm Jim. I'm with Newsy. We, uh, we started about seven years ago. And uh, the length of our content has much to do with the format uh, that we produce. We produce... Uh, what we call multi-source video news clips. We do our own research, write our own transcripts, have our own presenters, uh, have a pretty uh, rich and deep uh, distribution system uh, around the world. But in being able to compare and contrast and to take a look at how stories are being told from different angles, we found that, that two to three minutes is probably uh, what works best for us. Um, we uh, distribute across uh, our website uh, our apps for mobile, uh, our apps for tablet, uh, and uh, we just picked up uh, a Nifty Award in New York uh, this last week for over-the-top TV content, which I think is a really important part of where Snackable is going. Um, I also like Robert's point in terms of daisy chaining. You can take Snackable content and you can put it together in a chain uh, and you can make uh, longer form uh, content out of it, but our, our definition is uh, somewhere in the minute to 45 second to three minute range. I'm Raymond Atipa. I'm with uh, Shandy Media. We're about eight years old ourselves. We produce about 1,200 pieces of video content a month right now. Um, we go between a minute to minute and a half on most uh, news type of stories, but we also go all the way up to about 20 minutes per video piece. To us, snackable content um, is Yes, gr granted, short form video is very snackable, but for us, we can even produce a 20 minute content, keep the user engaged all the way, that still means snackable to us because they will keep eating and eating and eating and eating. 
and watching, 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 and sometimes we can loop them in for about an hour or so, depending if the content is being marketed to the right user, yeah. if that person is really wanting to get educated on either how to do some sort of makeup technique, and then followed by you know 20 minutes on the eyes, 20 minutes on the lips, 20 minutes on the hair, we've seen users, hundreds of thousands of them, stay on for over an hour. So, so Ray, given the volume of content that you guys produce on a regular basis, um, you're putting a lot out there. Um, we see um, a, lot, a lot of demand for content, but we also see CPM rates coming down. Yes. Um, can you really monetize content with just pre-roll and post-roll, or do you have other strategies for how you're doing that? Uh, pre-roll and post-roll is definitely uh, you know, the way to monetize the shorter form content. Um, shorter form news content, there's only so much you can put sponsored content inside of it. That's why we went into longer form content. Uh, longer form content is, you know, much easier for us to, you know, for example, since I was on the beauty thing, you know, we can go ahead and sell the, um, to a makeup brand, for example, on, on the eyeliner that's being used in a particular video, and, and they'll pay much higher CPM wise, you know, you can see upwards of 80 to $100 CPM on something like that, as opposed to, you know, remnant network of 8 to $12 CPM on a pre-roll. So, there is a ceiling to pre-roll. Um, as you move into mobile, you know, it, where 85% of our audience is gone now on our owned and operated sites, pre-roll has a ceiling because if you keep putting pre-roll, pre-roll, pre-roll in front of every single video, you're going to see that user exit. Yeah. I believe YouTube is one out of three videos or one out of four videos now. So, you know, if you average out the CPM, it drops down to like two, three dollars instead of you know eight to twelve. So that's why we start putting brands inside of the video. Jim, what's the, what's the right length for a pre-roll ad? Is it 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30? Where do you get the most bang for your buck? Yeah, I, uh, with, especially with shorter form, uh, 15 feels about right. Uh, a lot of our partners run 30s, uh, and they don't run into too much uh, of a problem. They still get very high completion rates. You know, to the cost per thousand thing, um, I think it's just really important to have multiple revenue streams we have both a, a business to consumer uh, that produces about the same amount of video uh, a month that you guys do. We also have a B2B uh, side to our business where we produce um, a high quality uh, multi-source video for uh, uh, a number of very large news organizations uh, in the world. We do it as a white label so you wouldn't know it was us unless you knew it was us. Um, and then we've, we've found a lot of luck. Uh, uh, in the syndication side. Uh, uh, a lot of our revenue comes from syndication and being able to create uh, a video experience for one of our partners that we can then um, uh, share uh, in the revenue that comes through. Tyler, what's your distribution look like on Facebook? Um, where, where do you see the impact? Do you see, uh, do you see trends of certain kinds of content? Do you see geographic distribution? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so every, every video we produce gets posted to our website, and then we have a fan page that's grown to 2 million fans in the last two years, and that has a reach beyond those fans of about 150 million people around the world, friends of fans that share and engage with the content. Uh, just dovetailing off of the pre- and post-roll discussion, we entered in into a very chaotic uh, marketplace for pre-roll advertising. It's very difficult for a new entrant to gain any sort of traction because the current model requires such a high volume of ad impressions and it's really uh, taken in the old uh, banner impression sort of model of, of advertising and we've really begun seeing a lot of traction selling inventory on a cost per view uh, basis because of the way we operate inside of Facebook, it's this sort of walled garden of human engagement and you don't have the challenges of having to get such a high volume to offset the, the bots and the fraud that takes place inside these marketplaces. So we try to work with uh, agencies and brands to work at getting a 15 second pre-roll and in some cases uh, they'll get a post-roll on top of the <coughs> 60 second news format and believe it or not, nobody seems to have complained about having to sit through an ad to get to the news. It's very much an accustomed way to get a news headline. Uh, and that's been going on for quite a, quite a while now. So distributing inside of Facebook, we 
are able to reach uh, huge global audiences on top of sort of a single video headline. Some brands will uh, play a video inside of Facebook, inside the, uh, the news feed. Right. Uh, other brands will use a thumbnail and actually uh, take the user outside the Facebook experience to a dedicated video landing page. Um, uh, what's working best for you, Tyler? Uh, well, we we embed a player. Uh, we work with Kaltura, and we have a, a player that is embeddable inside of Facebook. So we don't use. We launched two years ago before Facebook even had really any sort of native video platform offering to speak of. And now they're just starting to make leaps and bounds into that world, uh, having acquired LiveRail recently. But we we have our own player that's embeddable, and that allows us to have. Uh, huge amount of flexibility in terms of uh, calling into ad servers, controlling our inventory, uh, all the data and analytics behind user behavior. It's all accessible when we don't use uh, the native player. And, and Jim, what about you? What about Newsy? We, um, uh, we post every one of our videos uh, to Facebook. Uh, it starts with a silent, uh, uh, muted uh, autoplay. Um, we do that primarily because that uh, is what uh, our close contacts at Facebook uh, have suggested uh, that we do. Facebook's getting ready to change, uh, as most folks have read in the last 24 or 48 hours with how they play video in their news feeds. And so we'll change and adjust with them uh, and try to be on the forefront of what they think um, uh, works best uh, for their users. Um, uh, I'm intrigued uh, by the platform, uh, still trying to figure out uh, how to monetize it um, a little bit more effectively as uh, we're also trying to figure out how to monetize YouTube more rich, more much more richly and deeper uh, than, than what we're currently doing now. They're, they're two enormously important platforms. Ray, what are the challenges of uh, monetizing on Facebook for you? Monetizing on Facebook, I mean, fa Facebook for us is, uh, we don't look to monetize on Facebook necessarily, like you know, uh, Tyler's model for us, it's how do we bring them over to us yeah. more and more. So sometimes we'll put a video up there. Sometimes it'll be some kind of a thumbnail or you know, like kind of almost like the reveal shot of the actual video. When, and then we'll lure them over to our own operated sites because that's where we make our profit, um, especially especially on mobile because. You know, it's, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to monetize on mobile because of the, auto, uh, the autoplay restrictions on certain mobile devices. And um, we have a better, we find it better for at least some of our brands to actually bring them over rather than trying to get a piece of video to go viral on Facebook. So uh, Rob, uh, when, when, you're, when you're trying to drive content to a user, what are some of the inputs that you're using um, and, and, and how, do you, um, how do you build kind of a, a very personalized uh, video viewing experience? You were talking about ad or uh, you know, kind of building uh, you know, a sequencing of videos. Yeah. How is that done? Yeah, so really from our perspective, the key was you know, making, making video publishing easier for, let's just say, using metadata and using you know, new tech that's out there to let content find the user and less about the user navigating through thumbnails and widgets to try and find the content piece that they're looking for. So for us, it's really about context. So you know, it's easy from a you know, recommended video perspective to piece together a video stream to say these video assets are similar to each other, just put together a stream. The real trick or the real key to our technology has been able to, like, like Tyler and, and like Ray have been suggesting, you know, really find where the user is consuming what content the best and really create for them a user experience in that in-video yeah. player experience where no matter where you're viewing it from, you have the ability to really lean back and consume a stream. So the, those inputs are really wide and varied and really comes down to what works for a certain user within a given session. So just because I'm consuming, let's just say, um, you know, soccer content, but I'm an American in one environment, Statistically speaking, that might not be my main call. So you look at it historically, then you compare per session and say, oh, well, it was the World Cup. That's why I was consuming. But generally speaking, I'm a Cowboys fan. So show me more NFL content, uh, <laughs> which seems apropos this morning. But I think really it comes down to creating that context and the contextual experience for a user 
which is where I think the monetization key is really going to pick up in the next couple of years. So, so brand protection is a key issue. Uh, when we talk about you know, being able to put together kind of a personalized experience, um, you know, a, a, a brand advertiser like an airline probably doesn't want their pre-roll running ahead of a plane crash. Yeah. How, how do you protect against that? <laughs> I, 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 well, you think it, you, it's funny. There are so many articles of like these fails where it'll be, uh, I think one of the worst one, one was a, an article on Huffington Post about alcoholism and it was sponsored by Bacardi. And you're just like, oh, no. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's one of the issues where we've all sacrificed a certain level of security on the syndication aspect. We've yeah. all said, look, we're, we want to make the most out of this content. We want the most people to see it. So let's just put it out there and see where it goes. Uh, but I think it's getting to a point now where we're being able to leverage context, leverage metadata, and leverage user data in a way where there's the balance between contextually targeting and privacy. And I think that's going to be one of the big battles is you want brand safety, but how much are you willing to pay for that? And at the same time, how much is a user willing to give up their own you know, privacy or their own personalization to say, I'm willing to give up a certain aspect of my privacy to share the right data so you can build that context. To an extent, we've kind of learned you know, to give up some of our privacy from YouTube and some of the other distribution channels out there uh, that'll drive you know, targeted content to us. Um, they're getting over a billion views a day. Um, to what extent does, does YouTube actually play in uh, for you in distributing content? Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, open question to the panel. To what extent does YouTube play as a target? Is it a channel for you? Are you trying to get content to YouTube in order to draw people back to your own sites? What's the strategy with YouTube? Um, YouTube is where brands are created. You know, they're probably like Jim as well. You know, we have a very large syndication business. However, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of views a month. However, on YouTube is really where when you go after a sponsored brand, they want to see the YouTube views or you know, if you try to sell them against, let's say, an AOL views or, or things like that, you know, right. it's, it's not the same as YouTube. So YouTube is where brands are created. Subscriber count is very big. You know, you can have 100 million views a, a month on YouTube, but if your subscriber count is extremely low and you don't have an engaging audience and you're strictly like an SEO on YouTube, brands don't buy into that. Brands want to buy those extremely strong audience members. Uh, you know, the highly engageable audience which lives on YouTube. Now, YouTube is its own animal, very different than everything else. And even if you try to lure your audience away from YouTube, it dings your channel. You know, it, it, they want people as long as they, they want people living on it for 48 hours straight, or else your channel gets dropped down and it gets yeah. dropped down. So it's kind of like its own animal. We treat YouTube as its own business completely separate from syndication. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Robert, you know, when we talk about personalizing content, how do, we, how do we avoid losing people to that dark corner of YouTube where only cat videos and uh, horrific accidents happen? <laughs> well, it, it's funny, I, I think we were joking about, but I, I have a two-year-old daughter where, you know, she'll want to watch the little pieces and undoubtedly will go to YouTube. And after about five minutes, you'll always get to a cat video or some kind of, you know, eight-year-old boy hitting a baseball that hits his dad. And, and it's one of those things where it's, it's like the last call of internet consumption. It's like, wrap it up five minutes. We've made the most money off of you that we can. Time to shift you to another category of content, um, which seems to be that model there. But it becomes a, a, a lesson for you know, the rest of us in, in what we're all considering premium to say, what is the, the session value of a user? And I think from our perspective, you know, we've created a lot of privacy around a user's data and everything is anonymized in, in our technology, but it still comes down to figuring out what an average or, or what the consumption average is and figuring out the ROI per session. I think that's essentially what we're getting back to to say, what lessons can we take from that dark corner? Because it still is a closed ecosystem for the most, for yeah. the most part, where it's got to be its own business because there's no really way to attach into that without hurting, it, hurting your exposure in that ecosystem. So it's trying to learn lessons and really use that information to develop your own premium experience. This morning in the keynote, um, uh, one of the shocking statistics that I saw was that um, tablet consumption of NFL Now's content was only 7%. Um, uh, where does the tablet fit in terms of the viewer experience for snackable content, Jim? Well, you know, I think it's, it's really important to remember that one of the unique things about video is, is that it works 
on every one of the four screens. So it works on this screen. Um, it works on uh, Robert's uh, iPad Mini uh, that he has here, which I consider tablets different than, than uh, handheld devices. Uh, it works on PCs or notebooks. Uh, and it works uh, on the big screen. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, you, know, you were talking about some of the challenges that you've seen people run into with mobile. We were one of the first uh, video news uh, apps on the iPad, and it was really great because it wasn't a uh, enormously, I don't want to say cluttered, but you know now there's like tens of thousands of apps uh, out there uh, in that space. So you know I don't know about NFL's uh, uh, consumption. Perhaps they're not pushing their tablet uh, as much as uh, as they should, or perhaps they're not creating content that people are finding valuable. Um, uh, uh, on their tablet, but the key is, is to be able to produce a, not a generic, but a really relevant, meaningful, short, informative, value-added video, because it's a commitment for the user to watch a video that just works well uh, on all four of the platforms, whether you chain them together uh, in an OTT environment for a longer form experience, uh, or if it's just uh, a short hit uh, at the bus stop. Uh, uh, on your phone. Are you seeing different rates uh, for advertisers on different platforms and if so how does that direct uh, where you put the emphasis in deploying content? You know that is that is an absolutely uh, really really relevant and important question. Um, so you know a couple of years ago I got on a plane with our product developer and we flew out to San Francisco and we're like Mobile video advertising, baby. Mobile video advertising. And uh, we couldn't even pay for the flight back uh, with the deals that we had, had signed while we were out there. Uh, we, we, we were able to pay for the flight back, but it wasn't through mobile video advertising. And you know, you're seeing like $7 cost per thousands uh, uh, in, in mobile video. And just to, the, to your point about the airplane rack uh, being followed by a story about, uh, or being followed by an ad uh, uh, by an airline. You know, this is a new industry, and when people jump into it, including the four of us, you know, you're pioneering things. And if you're an advertiser that's buying ads in it, you're pioneering things. You're going to where the eyeballs, eyeballs are. Um, but I think that we're still waiting for some technology solutions to come in place. There's certainly enough metadata around a video to, to not maybe have an airplane uh, ad, airline ad run. Um, but then uh, there's also technology um, uh, solutions in place um, uh, to be able to, um, uh, uh, what your question, one more time, I'm sorry, I just, I just lost my train of thought. It was on, it was on um, you know, I did Oh, too. mobile. So we yeah, are, we're both lost. We, the, the other part is, sorry, <laughs> te technology and, sorry, technology and standards for mobile. There aren't really any, any standards for mobile, so. Uh, as part of being snackable content, you also have to have attention deficit disorder, and you'll forget your question that your panelist asked. So, <laughs> so, so Facebook acquired LiveRail, uh, AOL acquired Adapt TV, um, Twitter is launching uh, video ads, um, uh, and a lot of those, a lot of the acquisitions that are happening lately seem to be in the mobile ad space. Um, given that there seems to be kind of some excitement and some build around that. Are you going to be able to play, pay for the plane ticket now? Is that a changing marketplace? Um, I think that you have to continue to invest in it. You have to have multiple revenue streams. Uh, it's part of the reason uh, that we went with an acquisition with Scripps uh, and being able to have the capital to invest in those platforms uh, until they mature. Um, but you have to uh, keep working and keep testing. Um, you were talking about you know, YouTube is where brands go to be created. A lot of the things that we do on YouTube, we test things. Um, like today, we're rolling out like a, a, a 20 minute, 30 minute documentary about war and money that uses annotations uh, inside of YouTube where you're able to click uh, inside of a video and go to another video and try that. So, you know, you just have to keep innovating, you just have to keep trying um, uh, until you find something that works uh, and then you stick with it. And you stick with it until it doesn't work, and then you modify and change again. So, so um, that kind of dovetails into the, the notion that can I take snackable content like you've done with this uh, um, with this documentary yeah. and and build bits of snackable content into a cohesive experience? Absolutely, uh, it's one of the it's just kind of a different form of storytelling, 
and it's it's much more of an interactive form of storytelling where you know we were just talking about how video works really well across like all four screens the other thing that's really kind of weird about video as it stands right now is it's sight sound color motion emotion but it's also highly linear so it's it starts at this place and it ends at this place and so one of the things that I think with these new platforms offer is the ability for the user to control where they want to go inside of a video to be able to get what they find is most relevant to them or to, uh, to use a, a Robert's term context. Tyler, your, your, your videos are, are pretty prepackaged. They, they've, they've, they've got a, you know, a fixed beginning and a fixed end. Mm -hmm. um, but, but from a platform standpoint, um, where are you seeing engagement with your videos and is mobile uh, is mobile advertising something that you're targeting? Is it something you're trying to stay away from? What's the what's the impact for you? Uh, well, I think I mean mobile is a very interesting uh, segment. I mean, it, there's going to be billions of more people online. It's going to be through a mobile device over the next you know four years, and they're not going to look to uh, CNN if you're in Brazil for you know what's going on. They're going to come to you know one of these news organizations to figure out you know what news to follow. We use Facebook as our primary distribution, and their mobile user base is growing, so our mobile user base is growing. So, uh, you know, we don't have an app. We have a mobile version of the website. I think there's a lot of challenges with mobile still because there is no standard. There is a lot of fragmentation. When you look at playback for video on mobile devices, is a lot more fragmented than playback when you're plugged in to even a Wi-Fi connection on a desktop device, um, which, which is very limiting to when you look at the performance around advertising. I think when I've spoken to uh, contacts that are part of those big marketplaces that just you know, got acquired like LiveRail or Adapt TV, the demand for mobile is growing, but it still does not meet yeah. the 30 second demand out there. I think there's still a big shift that needs to happen where, uh, you know, you have all these television creatives being, you know, all the television spots being created and they're trying to still fit those, you know, round pegs into the square hole yeah. that is online and until that shift happens and until that fraud is weeded out and until they have that nice uh, environment to shift into where there is demand for 15, I think there's still going to be a lot of challenges in this space, but yep. I think we can do everything we can to prepare for that future. You, you, uh, you said the F word. Facebook? <laughs> Fragmentation. Fragmentation. Everybody looks at each yeah. other really worried. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? It's on video. Did I say that? You said the F word, fragmentation. Uh, it's probably one of the, you know, the banes of our existence. Uh, you know, um, how, are, how are you dealing with fragmentation? Do you need to have a mobile app, Ray? Um, well, mobile app will definitely give you higher CPMs than a mobile web web presence because to, to us, the more data you give to an advertiser, the more they're willing to pay. And you're able to give them a lot more data through an app than just uh, on the restrictions that a phone is giving you on you know, third-party cookies and, and mobile web pages. Um, we've seen a you know, huge jump in mobile over the last three years. We went from 30% mobile audience to 85% mobile audience. Wow. And uh, as these phones become bigger and bigger, we even saw that uh, of another 10% increase, which we went from 75 to 85 as a six came out. Um, so, you know, as far as, you know, fragmenting content goes, you know, you, you're gonna have to be able to you know, show your content everywhere which is possible these days. You know, we're even starting to play around with over the top right now. Um, you know, obviously longer form content there. The larger the screen, the more attention you have from the user. Smaller the screen, you know, they're looking to look and leave. So, so with, uh, with over the top, um, Tyler, you mentioned that people are, are sourcing their news, um, you know, more from you know, kind of s smaller, more targeted news agencies than they are even from CNN these days. Um, do, you, do, you see that, um, do you see that going OTT and actually being able to deliver a living room type experience for somebody who's seeking that type of CNN level uh, of content, is that, is that something that's in your future? Is that, uh, is that on, your, on your horizon? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it'd be pretty short-sighted for us to only do one-minute video news inside of Facebook, which is what we do now. I think as we grow our audience and create a brand online, there'll be natural extensions to that product offering. Uh, 
we've seen success in the marketplace, whether it's stitching together a lot of those news segments or doing some sort of Tinder style for news, swipe left for I like this, I don't like that, or uh, creating a longer form piece of journalism, you know, and having uh, a rabid fan base. I mean, there's some organization, organizations out there that do a really great job of that longer form journalism. They're bigger bets on the content that you're creating. We do a high volume, uh, you know, lower cost production model where we can cover a wide breadth of stories where we don't have to take as bigger bets on any, any individual story, but I think that's kind of the nature of that business as you get into the longer form uh, format, especially on over-the-top devices. When you look at a typical episodic TV show, um, uh, it's broken into snackable content segments. You know, you watch the first three and a half minutes, you get, you know, you get the intro, and then you get an ad, and then you watch another, you know, four to five minutes, and then you have another ad. How is that any different from snackable content? Is, is there a difference, and are we getting people moving in the direction of kind of consuming snackable content that way? I think this is going to be the year that we find out. Uh, we uh, are investing heavily uh, in OTET and uh, you know the idea of running um, for us uh, you know a two to three minute clip which is about how long it takes for us to be able to effectively tell our tell the story um, you know maybe running two of those and then uh, an ad and then maybe two more because it comes off uh, on OTT it comes off much more as a television commercial you wouldn't call it a pre-roll. You wouldn't call it a post-roll. It's just a TV ad uh, that, that's there. And um, we're finding with Snackable, uh, uh, the kinds of pieces that we produce, there's a high use of autoplay. So like in, on our website, uh, which we're going to autoplay <clears throat> enable uh, in the first quarter of this next year, uh, if they watch like two videos there, they'll watch like maybe four, videos or something like that on, on one of our, our apps or our mobile web, uh, but they'll watch like eight videos on OTT. Uh, the engagement levels are a lot higher. Um, I think that this is a format that I really believe uh, that I don't sound like the guy on the plane saying mobile video advertising, mobile video advertising, but we're going we're gonna to say OTT this year uh, in a major way uh, and, and see if it works. And, and I, think, I, think that it's, I think that it's going to. I think that Viewers have that expectation that there has to be some type of, of monetization that occurs. Uh, and um, the big question, I think, is, is as these big players step into OTT and start trying to charge subscriptions to people, are they really going to be able to sell those subscriptions at the same level of a return on investment that they've been able to in the, in the cable bundle? In, um, uh, in your world, do you ever see us coming to a place where you can string together enough snackable content that it just becomes a linear channel? Is, or is that too extreme? Is, it, is, is, the, is volition of actually clicking something and making a decision a part of it, mm -hmm. or, is, or do we really get to a full lean back experience where it's just like a broadcast television station? I think on lifestyle type of content, you can totally do that. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. We'll go ahead and stick 40 videos in a playlist and you'll actually get a percentage of your users watching 40 videos, watching 38 videos, 35 mm -hmm. videos. Um, when you get into OTT, I think the OTT audience is demanding a bit of a higher broadcast quality content, you know, as opposed to like the YouTube star that just turns on their camera on their iMac and starts recording. That's why, you know, Sony with Crackle and, and Hulu and, you know, they're um, and Netflix, you know, they're investing in these shows with actual major, you know, artists that are, or actors, actresses that are, that are in these shows. So when you have that higher broadcast quality content, sticking an ad in there kind of just goes seamless, you know, as opposed to like, oh man, I got to get through this to see this person's face again. To what extent are ad blockers affecting your ability to monetize snackable content? Is it, is it a factor? We haven't really felt much from it to be honest. Anybody else? That's great, that's good news. Um, in terms of, uh, if content is king, and I think it still is, um, you gotta get the content from somewhere. Um, recently, Ellen DeGeneres launched Ellen Tube um, as a way to kind of source more content for her audience. It seems to have kind of evolved into a theme for her show. Um, 
is user generated content the source of most of what you know YouTube started? Is that is that something that you see as being a way to, to drive in new ideas or new content? Right? Um, we we bring users on board through social media. As far as user generated content, that's not our business model per se, but you know, user generated content lives on something like YouTube. You know, and, and that's that's really what that home base is. You have bloggers with six, seven million subscribers and it's Literally, <laughs> no bells and whistles to it. It's like one light behind them and an iMac <laughs> camera. And, but, you know, they have these little, you know, teenage girls that are just dying to be them. And that's where user-generated content lives. Um, for us, you know, we produce everything all the way up to a 15-minute talk show once a week that, that streams online. And we'll go ahead and get, you know, we have, doing all our accounts on Instagram, for example, we have several million followers and we'll go ahead and have contests for them to even be on a panel things like that so for us it's more of a social engagement than user generation um, location based advertising has made kind of a comeback this year um, to what extent does location based advertising affect your decisions in terms of ad buys Tyler uh, can, can I add one more part oh, to absolutely. that? Yeah, okay. Uh, in terms of user generated content I think it's there's a really unique opportunity right now where uh, sometimes in a news outlet, the first source of a story will be uploaded via Facebook or Twitter and yep. will be, uh, and you can cross reference that with other sources and in some cases beat, you know, other major news organizations to break a story and access to that sort of content, uh, you know, you can track the shares and see what sort of engagement the snowball has sort of created and accessing those folks has never been easier. I mean, you click on their profile and direct message them or, you know, there's so many ways to get in touch with these folks in terms of a journalistic perspective. Yeah. Uh, access to those folks has never been better. So I think it's, um, you know, citizen journalism is dead, but I think there's sort of that middle ground of, you know, there's interesting stories happening out there in the world and they're being posted on the social media and they're going to be interesting to other folks and we have you know uh you know data folks that are tied into our newsroom that help gauge some of that editorial in, in a way uh location-based advertising is interesting uh we don't get too uh, granular with location but certainly uh, geographies and things like that is very interesting. Uh, you can tie in, you need an app to really tie in the capabilities of location on a mobile device, but uh, we haven't seen a huge demand other than geog you know, the, the obvious geographies for location-based advertising. We, uh, we talked earlier and you mentioned that uh, a lot of your audience uh, is outside the <coughs> United States because Newsbeat Social has become one of the primary ways that they can consume content through Facebook. Can you talk a little bit about um, the international audience and how you monetize them? Yeah, I mean it's it's really, I mean, pretty wild to witness it firsthand. We have we have we track every story we post. We see how many likes, comments, shares, and track the engagement on every every story. And we'll have you know just the other day we had a story about uh, sh a World War II ship being discovered off the East Coast somewhere. This guy, he's got to be like 92 years old, was on, in the comment thread on Facebook commenting, you know, that he's seen subs off the coast of Maine, you know, and then people are chiming in from the Philippines and Pakistan, and some some guys, trolls are getting in there trying to attack the old guy, and then the guy from Pakistan is <laughs> defending him, and it's like this whole conversation is happening on this one uh, one minute news segment. So we have a really uh, global audience where people not only watch the stories but interact with each other which I think is very cool uh, in terms of monetizing them it's uh, uh, you know we we work directly with networks and brands and agencies so when uh, you know a, a global brand needs to access their audience across half the world we can launch a story and have global viewers overnight watching that story and watching their advertisement. Do you see any uh, emerging markets for your type of content? Any, any key areas that really stand out in your mind? Uh, India is probably the, they're the second largest country on Facebook. They have 100 million users, uh, second to, to the US, which is about 180. 
and you know by far they have a much larger population and we launched a, a, a backpack reporter there and have started getting huge uh, followings in India. I think the Philippines is also interesting too. Uh, Facebook is really through their internet.org efforts trying to push a lot more folks online and we're seeing that firsthand through our viewership around the world. J Jim, do you have uh, um, uh, content consumption in international markets? Yeah, it's, it's kind of wild to get your app reports and find out that like you're really huge and like <clears throat> Iberia, you know what I mean, or, or, or some faraway place. One of the things that, that we're doing, uh, kind of similar to um, what Tyler has mentioned, is uh, we've tried like three times now to roll out uh, inter internationalization of our product. What does that mean? That means multiple languages. Um, and so uh, I'm happy to report we've got a deal uh, for us to uh, do uh, stories in Spanish for a, for a big provider that we just recently closed uh, and that's really cool we tried we tried Mandarin uh, for a long time working with the Wall Street Journal and News Corp uh, and others and and had a, a really fantastic uh, producer and, and presenter for that um, so it's kind of like back to the theme that I've been saying about you just keep trying stuff uh, until um, you, you see what works you kind of you go in with your best ideas uh, the best answer that you can come up with at the time um, uh, and then give it a shot. So I'm really, really hopeful for the for the multiple languages uh, with our product. It's part of our process that works out well. And, and, and Ray, uh, you know, a Holly Scoop, uh, Kim Kardashian is worldwide. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you get a lot of international traffic. Perhaps. How do you monetize that? Uh, well, we monetize. You know, the best for us is the English-speaking countries where English is primary, like the Australia, UK, and um, even. You know, countries like India, you know, lower CPM for us. UK, Australia, much higher international CPM. Um, Japan, yeah. higher CPM, you know. Yeah. Um, it really also depends about, you know, the people in, in each of these locations. But, you know, Kim Kardashian's story, for example, you'll be surprised. You know, like, there's certain aspects of that story that certain international um, countries would, would enjoy watching or enjoy hearing about. Um, you know, we, we've tried in the past, you know, the different languages of just taking Hollywood news and just, con you know, completely just translating it into a different language. And it doesn't work that well for us. You know, they really want to know, you know, if you're going into Mexico, they want to hear about the telenovela stars and their soccer stars and yeah. things yeah. like that as opposed to just Kim Kardashian and Espanol, you right. know. So we've, we've tested some of that stuff out and, uh, you know, it's the, the younger audiences of these countries that consume that, our content at least. And, you know, CPMs are not where the U.S. CPMs are. You know, yeah. U.S. CPMs are number one still. And uh, yeah. that's, that's why we keep pushing good old America here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Rob, uh, you know, from an international perspective, um, are you picking up on those trends? Are you seeing, you know, uh, folks coming in, in in localized markets and are you able to direct uh, content to them that may be germane? Um, or is it still going to be, you know, uh, are you able to you know, direct them towards telenovela stars or you know, soccer stars or what have you? Yeah, I, th I think it, it becomes a question where it combines multiple parts of the equation that we've been talking about with respect to syndication, with respect to getting the context and then melding that with whatever metadata or data that you have on the user and the content piece where you know, internationally, uh, unarguably, the CPMs are lower, but when you have the ability to syndicate content from a provider that's giving you it on a CPM basis, and there are tons of companies that do that, a few that do it well, but when you're able to bring in the right kind of content where you have that arbitrage, that's where the real value becomes, yeah. where now you can piece together an experience for a user internationally, utilizing some of your O&O content, where obviously there are higher CPMs, but then to start creating a relationship with them, utilizing syndication partnerships to keep that experience going, which ultimately leads then to the monetization standpoint, finding the right partner that can help you monetize it in the right way, which ultimately brings back to context, where if you have the right metadata on the clip, you have the right user information or user data, and then you have the right partner to help monetize it, even programmatic being what it is now, like you said earlier, when you have the right amount of data, you're going to be able to monetize that. And, and some people have sold away those international rights for guaranteed CPMs, which right. 
tip of the hat if, if, that, if that's the way to go. But yeah. I mean, it's, it becomes less responsive and more saying international users will just pay for them with a flat fee this way. And that becomes a little dismissive when it comes to the international consumption and distribution of content, which I think we're all going to have to start admitting that, you know, the international consumption side, there's got to be a better solution for American brands and, and who are trying to view ourselves as, as really you know, catering to international users, it's got to be better than Kim Kardashian in Spanish. Absolutely. Please say it's better than Kim Kardashian in Spanish. So. I don't know. What is Kim Kardashian in Spanish? Uh, it's I, it's, I it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, <laughs> so in terms of, uh, in terms of being able to, um, being able to target that, target that content and monet yeah. monetize, um, uh, uh, you know, being able to uniquely, you know, find that. Um, Tyler, for you, when when are you um, when are you seeing um, that really begin to break over uh, in terms of the international market where you actually have targeted international content? Uh, I think that's driven by the consumption. So you know, uh, any number of one of our stories will more than likely do well globally. Uh, a lot of stories having a, a reporter in India. She works on her own in India and is able to have a finger on her pulse in that region and really cover that area well. So it becomes a little more localized, and at the same time, they're going to be following what we cover here in the U.S. Uh, I mean, I think any one of our stories has, you know, it sort of has to pass this. You know, we produce 50 uh, one-minute videos a day uh, over, you know, 1,100 to 1,200 a month. And they all sort of have to pass this test of whether or not it's going to be appealing to this global viewer of news. And I think as we grow our volume over time, we'll develop out more niche channels that will help uh, define growth in these markets. So we may have an India tech beat, for example, versus uh, you know, a US-centric one. Let's talk about um, ad ops and uh, in terms of ad sales. Um, are you going after premium brands and offering them uh, packages? Ray, you've got you know kind of a dedicated video landing page strategy. Um, you know, are you selling takeovers? Are you selling companion ads? And how's that working for you? Um, sales team wise, um, my personal thoughts is, you know, everything's going to go programmatic except for branded entertainment and spot and high level sponsorships. You know, trying to compete against a tremor or a Bright roll or you know even live real marketplace you know to sell Coca Cola half a million pre roll impressions you know it's I don't think that's going to exist much longer because people are only going to buy programmatically on things like that and they're going to buy audiences so the more data you can give them you know the higher you can drive those CPMs up for that Coca Cola user who they want to make sure that their user drinks Aquafina for example you know if you can give that back to them they're willing to pay twice that amount. So for us, we sell branded, you know, that's what we sell directly. So, you know, Coca-Cola wants to reach this audience, we'll create a 12 part series for them and include the brand inside of this series and, and really craft the series even as far as going and, you know, wrangling the celebrity into the video for them. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that, that's what I think the direct sales efforts are, are definitely going to go towards, at least from our perspective. Jim, what about you? Are you seeing a, are you seeing a, um, a benefit to going to do, do direct sales, or are you relying on programmatic? Um, both. Uh, we also do product placement for Coke. Um, Kidding. Uh, and uh, uh, but but we're doing both. Uh, we're going for high level sponsorships. The stuff that we produce is is of uh, very high quality. Uh, it attracts a, a high end user. So. Um, uh, we're we're moving forward both with uh, uh, our own sales team uh, as well as a ton of stuff uh, in programmatic, and then also really huge, as you had mentioned, really large sponsorships. The kinds of sponsorships where someone can come in and buy a very significant uh, portion of your inventory um, uh, in a in a really thoughtful, packaged way. How does product pr placement work in news? <laughs> It doesn't if you're ethical. <laughs> uh, we, we don't do branded content. We don't do, I'm kidding, we don't do product placement. Okay. Uh, we're across the street from the journalism school at the University of Missouri uh, where ethics are, are very, very run high uh, as they do in our newsroom. 
but uh, you know, there are some companies that are well suited uh, for branded content. And that doesn't mean that we wouldn't produce a branded content piece for another company, another news organization. I just don't see us doing that within ourselves uh, under the Newsy brand. Awesome. Um, we, uh, we have about 10 minutes, 10 minutes left, and I, uh, I asked the panelists uh, earlier if they'd be willing to take questions from the audience, so I wanted to open it up to, uh, to the floor. Um, do you have questions about monetizing content for any of these tycoons of snackable content? <laughs> Anybody? Any Somebody. Yes, the there back. you go. Yeah, mine's kind of in the monetization, but when I think of stackable, it seems like it's mostly to consume through the mobile device. This question's for, for Robert. In order to monetize it, you need to have eyeballs staying on the content. How do you guys, on the recommendation side, how are you going to serve recommendations when you're kind of losing a lot of the landscape on a smaller kind of device? So the question is, is on, on a small device, um, how do you, how do you get, get the recommendations yeah. when you're losing a lot of the landscape in terms of the interaction? Yeah, no, and, and one, of our, one of our the key parts to our technology, thank you for that, is actually creating a different experience on each device. Yeah. So by living in player, we have the ability to really create a unique advice, a, a unique div, uh, experience across each device in that you know, for the longest time, people were talking about tablets as being second screen. Right. But in reality, for a whole new generation, that's first screen. So the whole delineation of first screen, second screen, now there's third screen and all this, all this other stuff. But viewing whatever, wherever the viewer is consuming the content, that in our view is now the first screen. So by making it a unique experience, to your original point in that if you have, you know, uh, yeah, advertorial based or native advertising and content pieces, now with Iris, you have the ability to prioritize prioritize that native advertising piece or, or that sponsored content above others. So you have the ability to prioritize an ebb and flow with monetization. But back to what, what I think the core of the question really comes down to is getting more users, I think it's less about more users consuming more content on any given device than giving them a premium experience on the device that they're on. Yeah. So that wherever they're watching right now in their view, in their eyes, they're watching premium content that's relevant to them. And I think that's really going to stick longer with a user with regards to a brand really giving them the kind of content that they want to watch when they want to watch it. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Right here. It's a little high level, but uh, what trends, like technological or otherwise, are you guys seeing impacting your bottom lines, consumption lines, record lines, uh, you know, present planning in the next 18 months? Predict the future. Well, let me start with that one only because I think one of the things that we joked about before was with, with every content piece, there's an ad. Uh, and right now the trend of pre-roll, pre-roll after every video because everyone's trying to cram in as much monetization in any given session that they can, that they can have. I think one of the things that I think we're going to see pick up is really being able to ebb and flow, A-B test advertising placement to consumption to say, okay, if it's a 15-second ad, you can hammer someone after a minute, but don't keep hitting them with 30 seconds. I think there's going to be a lot of it when it comes to ad insertion and ad placement on the yeah. timing aspect of it. Yeah. Jim, that's a good point. Any comment about that? Um, you know, I think technology is just going to continue to march on, make uh, experiences greater. The, the faster the phone, the faster the video, uh, all of the, the basic technology trends that uh, uh, that we've talked about as well as you know the brand protection thing that we were discussing before. I think probably one of the biggest things that you're going to see in the next 12 to 18 months is, is I think you're going to see a pretty big sea change. Uh, you've already seen uh, quite a bit of consolidation this last year, a lot of uh, M&A activity happening, and I think you're going to see a lot more of that happen in the next 12 to 18 months where um, uh, there's a, lot of, uh, a whole lot of players uh, in the space and I really hope that that continues. Um, but it could be consolidation in terms of them being bought up uh, by larger companies. Uh, it could be consolidation by uh, uh, some companies uh, taking different kinds of exits or, or maybe running out of money. Um, but there's been a whole bunch of money uh, thrown into this industry in the last 12 to 18 months. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens 12 to 18 months from now uh, from, from that perspective. Ray, without giving away any trade secrets, what are you going to be doing in the next 12 to 18 months that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's taking advantage of new trends? Uh, 12 to 18 months, I think, uh, hmm. we're, we're, we're going to be focusing more on more, uh, even more premium content. Um, content that 
you won't be living at you know too many other places. We're even looking at bringing back some of this premium content and exclusively having it live on our own and operated sites, as opposed yeah. to just letting it syndicate and making pennies on the dollar, as opposed to really building a premium base. You know, we right now have quite a bit of audience on our own and operated sites, but uh, for us, that's that's the plan of action. Is yeah. More users that can live uh, on our sites and view content exclusively on our sites, you know, our, our company becomes much more valuable. So attraction more than distribution yes. is where you're going to be able to monetize. Yeah. Interesting. Tyler, what about you? What do you think about the future? <coughs> uh, specific to this conversation? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the legacy news folks. Uh, I mean, the Wall Street Journal, I read in the you know, a couple of weeks back that CNN will probably get dropped by Dish Network and a lot of these uh, big news organizations that have been supported through, you know, sub fees by their cable distributors yeah. are needing to reinvent their models. And, you know, CBS News is coming out with an app. CNN has an app. Everyone's got their app to play in. And I think, truth be told, they're going to have a very difficult time attracting that new viewer that they lost on television. And it will be interesting to see what sort of shifts that causes in the industry. We're certainly hoping and betting on that, you know, that viewer will come to us to get some of their news headlines. And I think it's sort of this ecosystem where everybody's going to contribute somehow, but it, it's not going to be through the sort of legacy model in television. I agree with Tyler. I think one of the things that happens is no matter how hard you fight it, expenses rise to meet revenues. And the ability to monetize it mobile at seven dollar cost per thousand versus what you're able to do uh, through a cable bundle of affiliate fees plus advertising, um, it'll be real interesting to see if uh, if, if folks can keep, can compete uh, uh, in in that type of economic environment. Does unbundling like HBO and CBS going uh, over the top and direct to consumer benefit um, the snackable content world? You know, that's an excellent question, and you know, uh, it waits to be seen. Um, uh, I think that uh, some of the big players that are stepping into OT T are finding that uh, from a strategic standpoint, it gives them some type of, of leverage in negotiations with regards to retransmission consent uh, fees or, or bundling fees that they get. Uh, affiliate fees that they get uh, from cable systems. And the real question that, that, that will be interesting to watch happen in the next 12 to 18 months is, are they able to monetize those services near the same levels that they are able to in their legacy systems? Uh, and is that a sustainable long-term play for them? Uh, and does it really give them leverage uh, with regards to carriage and cable and satellite? Another question over here. Syndication, sponsored uh, content. It's got sponsored it. content, a CPM wise sponsored content. Um, you know, but you know, pre roll is obviously the bulk of it right now. If you're to pre roll and syndication pre roll, of course, and where you you know take a piece of whatever pre roll the publisher, the end publisher ends up serving. Syndication. Uh, Pre-roll for us, we're, I mean, the way we operate inside of Facebook, we're able to, out of any given headline, pull out very specific audiences for advertisers and really provide them a premium pre-roll product and, in some cases, uh, post-roll because, you know, 85% of our audience will finish the entire, you know, one-minute news segment, so there's opportunity on the back end as well. Thanks, Tyler. I'd like to thank our uh, members of the panel. Uh, for coming today and for sharing uh, their, their knowledge of this industry. Um, and gentlemen, um, thanks for joining me here today. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.